Hello everyone, my name is Slobodan Mitrovic. Today I will tell you about some techniques for constructing local computation algorithms. And I will begin by describing two scenarios which I believe are familiar to every single of us. So the first one is navigating through cities. So imagine that you have a map of Freiburg. Okay? And uh, you, for instance, want to go from Minster to Martinstor. And you find these two places on, on the map and then you skim over the over the streets, the neighboring streets of these two places and soon enough you figure out that this green path is short enough uh, to get you from one uh, to the second place. Okay, good. So that's it. Uh, the second scenario that I want to bring up is file decompression. Now imagine that you have an archive of images which is a couple of gigabytes large. And, but unfortunately, uh, you call the, you name this archive as images.rar. So the name itself doesn't tell you much. But even worse, when you open, uh, when you look at the list of files in this archive, you just see a bunch of uh, files which are numbered, right? Still none of the names uh, tell you much. Well, what will you do? Most likely, click on a couple of images. Uh, you see uh, where images are from, and you could use that uh, to guess uh, what this archive is about. What very likely you will not do is uh, uncomp uncompress the entire file, which contains uh, five gigabytes of material, and then look at a couple of images. But rather, you will select a couple of them while they are still in compressed form, and then just view those while ignoring the rest. Um, there was even lots of theoretical work uh, showing that these type of operations, uh, these type of decompressions, uh, can be done very efficiently. Um, okay, good. So the question is now, what is common to these two scenarios? Right. In one case, we have file decompression. In the second case, we have uh, we have navigation through cities. Also, the first one is that in both of the cases, uh, we have some uh, potentially uh, large underlying structure, and we look at only a small part of the structure uh, to figure out what we want to do. Like in the case of the maps, there are so many streets, but we looked only at a couple of streets that are surrounding these two places in order to find this green part. So the second one is that our operations are consistent. What do I mean by this? I mean that, let's, let's look at uh, the map. If, I, uh, if you would ask uh, for a short path uh, between every uh, two points, uh, uh, every two points on this map, well, uh, after asking uh, lots of uh, these kind of questions, you would be able to recreate the full map of Freiburg. And, this, and a similar here, uh, if you would ask uh, what is uh, image 9, what is image 10, what is image 11, and so on, uh, if you would collect all these images, it would give you the whole archive. Right? Uh, okay, so this is what we mean by consistent. And finally, we are able to traverse both of these objects in some meaningful and, sim and simple way. So, for instance, um, when we want to... Um, uh, when, when you want to see an image, the program behind uh, has some data structures or lookup tables for this archive, which it can use uh, to decompress only image 13 in this case. Or on the other hand, if we talk about maps, right, we can look at neighboring streets and just being able to navigate through this uh, city by skimming uh, over the map. So, in terms of the algorithmic sense, the first uh, the first property, uh, being able to inspect only small part, is something uh, which refers to complexity, right? And we will see, uh, we will say a few more words about this later. Uh, consistent means that it's meaningful in some sense. That the, the the replies that we are getting are actually underlying some actual structure. Um, and being able to traverse the object means that we have access. Uh, we have a way to probe uh, this uh, potentially uh, big collection of data, okay? And finally, there is one more property, which is perhaps even the most important here, implicit property, is that 
the entire output is very large. And this is why we don't want to compress the whole high. Or this is why we don't want to compute all the shortest paths uh, for this map. But the thing here is that we need only small part of the output. And we would like to compute this small part of the output efficiently. And now this is uh, what takes us to local computation algorithms. Because this is exactly the point of local computation algorithms. And uh, this, uh, this type of, uh, of, of algorithms were introduced uh, by, by this set of authors in 2011 and 12. And uh, let me be uh, slightly more formal than these two examples that we saw. So again, uh, in this setup, we think that we are given potentially huge input. Okay, and there is some function f that acts on, on this input. Uh, let's say f is uh, the compression algorithm. Now, uh, the point is that the output is also huge. And, and uh, in many cases, we would like uh, to learn only a small, tiny part of the output, like this green part here. And ideally, uh, we would like to learn this small part of the output without having to evaluate f on the entire input but uh, on some uh, on on the small part on small subset of the input, and um, we are doing that by uh, having some uh, some access to this input, of course, uh, and the access uh, to the input that we, the most basic that we are assuming here is that we can ask for the i bit of the input, right? And so again, this is now setup. Uh, we want to learn this small green part. Uh, ideally by looking at only small part of the input, and this is type of access that we have, uh, which we also call props. Okay? Good. Now, um, for the rest of the talk, uh, we, will, uh, we will discuss uh, some techniques for designing, uh, for designing uh, local computation algorithms. But it is going to be much simpler to um, uh, to, to give examples and think of these techniques, if we have an example, and as a running example uh, of example problem, we will take approximate maximum matching. So let me start just by briefly recalling uh, what is uh, approximate maximum matching. Uh, so first of all, a matching is a set of uh, given the grammar G. A matching is set of edges such, such that uh, no two edges uh, are uh, incident. Yeah, for instance, uh, these three uh, red edges uh, in the graph, uh, they form a matching because uh, no two edges uh, share a vertex. And uh, in this talk and in this presentation, we will be uh, interested in uh, approximate maximum matchings, in, in constant factor approximate maximum matchings, which means that we want to output matching, which is not much smaller than uh, size of the max of maximum matching. Uh, so for instance, uh, we, we can, uh, if you look, if you look at the matching that con uh, that consists of these three edges, we can certainly augment this matching by, by, by let's say, adding this edge here. But we are also happy with these three edges, right? because it is not much smaller than adding this one extra edge. Okay, and so this will be uh, running. Uh, this will be toy uh, toy problem that we'll be using in the rest of this talk. Good. So. <clears throat> Uh, now I want to phrase uh, these properties uh, about these two scenarios uh, in the language of metrics. Uh, and I will focus on, on this complexity, uh, meaningful, uh, and what are and define what are local props. So first, local props and complexity. Well, um, again, we want we have some huge underlying graph, right? We, we cannot store this entire graph into memory. We cannot traverse this entire graph memory, but we need to, but we have to uh, access edges and vertices of this graph somehow. And uh, the, a probe that we can make is uh, saying, if you give me vertex i, I can tell you what is, and you can give me vertex i, you can give me j, and I will tell you what is the j neighbor of vertex i. Right? I, I will give you I will give you um, a vertex that goes uh, that goes across the J incident edge uh, to I. Okay, good. So this is the type of uh, probes uh, to our graph that we will assume we have at our disposal. 
And uh, by having this type of probes, our goal would be to uh, our goal would be to say whether a given edge is 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 matched. Uh, and our goal would be to do this by using as few probes as possible. And again, a number of probes that we need to answer these type of questions, like in particular whether a given edge is matched or not, is uh, what uh, will uh, decide complexity of our approach. Good. So, <clears throat> when we say meaningful and consistent, uh, so how about this, right? Let, let us look at this example. So, we have a query, we ask whether edge E is matched. Well, certainly, yes, there is a matching. There is some matching in the graph where E is in that matching, right? Uh, so the question is why we don't always answer yes, right? So you ask me whether an edge is matched. Well, yes, in some matching it is. Uh, and uh, the problem is that clearly this would be too trivial and not very meaningful. Uh, the, the point is that if you ask for uh, many edges, E1, E2, EK, e uh, and if you keep on saying for them yes, some of them would uh, actually share endpoints, and we would like to avoid this. So the, the real question that we are asking is uh, if, uh, uh, if you're asked a sequence of queries, not only one, but, but a sequence of queries, and for them you provide whether an edge is in the matching or not, then altogether answers that your algorithm gives should form, jointly should form a match, right? So for instance, uh, this is edge E1, and you say, yes, this edge is some matching, fine. Now, if I ask you about the edge E2, the answer should be no, right? Otherwise, something goes wrong. So this is what consistency, this is what uh, consistency means. Having this in mind, we can define local computation algorithms as follows. It is a way of consistently answering queries, in our case, let's say, matched or not matched, edge, uh, via a small number of probes. So let us see how this definition flies with the following algorithm. So I will show you a very fast LCA algorithm, which is not very specific. So again, query as before is to answer whether edge E is matched or not. And the algorithm uh, will maintain a list of edges, uh, which will be a matching. Initially, this matching is empty. And now, when it gets a query for edge E, it will say, well, if there is no uh, neighbor of E inside that edge of E in my matching list so far, then I want to add E to this match. Otherwise, I do nothing with E, I just report that E is not matched. And moreover, I won't remember this decision. Cool, so it's a very simple approach. At the end, that's how uh, GD algorithm for maximum matching works, right? Uh, but the point is that it requires open space. And especially that we talk about large graphs, uh, this in many cases uh, would be too much space. But even more importantly, uh, this approach doesn't have, uh, doesn't enjoy that nice feature of being able to execute multiple copies of LCA at the same time. It means, it, it seems that by this approach, because you, you want to remember this decision, that every query you execute, uh, it, it affects, it affects future queries, right? It affects uh, answer to future queries. And ideally, we would like to avoid this. Um, so um, here is a defined definition of LCA, and uh, this will be um, the final, uh, the final refinement, uh, which is uh, so LCA is a way of consistently answering queries with a small number of probes. And now what we add is uh, by using a small space. And now if we use small space, then we will enjoy. Uh, then our approaches will have uh, many nice. Uh, many nice uh, features. Uh, great. So, uh, as we said, uh, we'll be working uh, in the rest of this presentation, we'll be working in the approximate maximum matching. So, before, even before we see any techniques, let me just uh, give outline uh, of known results of known uh, round complexities. Um, oh, sorry, of known query complexities for uh, LCA. Um, so, um, Arnes and Ron uh, designed an algorithm that runs in delta to the of uh, log delta many rounds. 
Uh, then there was another break that got uh, to, to the of of delta. Um, now there were a couple of results uh, that got uh, um, that got polynomial dependence on delta. Uh, I would like to to mention that uh, this result uh, by uh, Levi Rubinfeld, uh, Yot from 2017. Uh, their main focus is on maximum uh, one, one plus approximate maximum matching. So they are getting stronger result than constant stronger results than constant types of approximate matchings. Uh, and this is why, in general, their bound is is higher. But in any case, uh, if you if you directly take uh, their approach, uh, this doesn't give you better than of delta uh, of delta square. Uh, this is uh, pretty much the point of uh, stating uh, this result in this form. Um, so uh, let me also mention that for this result by the and Nuito, uh, their main goal was to get uh, very uh, much more efficient than what was known previously, much more efficient result for MA Yes, which they got. Uh, their technique also uh, gives uh, bounds for uh, gives bounds for um, uh, for uh, approximate maximum matchings, uh, which is this much. And finally, uh, here is a result that gives uh, linear uh, linear query uh, complexity uh, uh, linear query complexity for answering uh, the type of queries that we saw earlier. Actually, it's slightly different type of queries, but uh, this is essentially around complexity times uh, times log n. Um, and let me just add uh, that uh, some of these, for instance, this result, uh, it is stated uh, it is stated uh, as of delta in uh, expectation. This is clearly complex stated in the result. Uh, what I'm stating here uh, is the worst case complexity. Uh, this result, the, the last one, is also worst case complexity, and one can turn the result, this from 2012, uh, uh, expected uh, of delta to the worst case delta square, um, uh, at least when we care about uh, constant factor uh, approximate metrics, and we care about multiplicative approximation. So these are um, the results, uh, known results uh, for um, approximating matrix. Uh, and I would like also to add that um, these papers, uh, some of them consider only matchings, but um, most of them consider other problems. And in particular, they have techniques on how to get LCA for a maximum dependent set and set cover as well. Um, and uh, one more slide about uh, prior work before we move to techniques. Uh, LCA uh, was studied in context um, of, of many graph problems, and here is uh, just um, some list of these problems. We also saw earlier that uh, it was studied in kind of a context of uh, decompressing, um, decompressing uh, messages. Um, and in general, there has been a significant interest, uh, uh, especially lately, uh, for designing efficient uh, LCA algorithms. The rest of this presentation is outlined as follows. First, we will talk about peering algorithm, which is an approach for constructing matchings regardless of LCA set. Then we'll talk about three techniques for LCA and all uh, of them in the context of matchings. The first one is reducing LCA computation to local algorithms. The second one is pacifying this uh, reduction. And the third one is looking at a slightly uh, different uh, peeling approach, uh, which truncates its execution with the aim of getting very efficient algorithms with good probabilities. Before we move to talking about peeling algorithm, let me just mention that we'll be using capital delta to denote the maximum degree of the input graph, and we will think of delta as being much, much smaller than that. And it is actually an interesting question uh, for many problems in the context of LCA, whether we can design efficient algorithms uh, that, uh, that are efficient also when delta is some small polynomial in N. Good. So, um, the peeling approach. The high-level idea of peeling algorithm is to take care of vertices uh, starting uh, with the highest degrees and then uh, and then looking at that smaller de degree uh, uh, level by level. So uh, first, you start 
by looking by trying to take care of vertices that have the degree between delta over 2 and delta. Now for these vertices, uh, one can show that there is always a matching, uh, not necessarily maximum, not necessarily maximal, but there is a matching, there is some matching in the graph uh, that covers uh, a constant fraction of these high degree vertices. And actually, it's not hard to find such a matching. So the idea is to find one such matching, uh, add, this, uh, uh, add this matching uh, to the, uh, as part of the output, and remove all high degree vertices. And now, after this step, the remaining, uh, the maximum degree of, of the remaining graph would half, at least half, would become uh, delta over 2 or less. Okay, and then we repeat this process. So, to be more specific, uh, this is why this approach proceeds in log delta many iterations. As the first step, we define these high degree vertices, right, which is delta over 2 for i is equal to 1, and then uh, it gets smaller and smaller. And now, to see uh, how the remaining steps function, let us look at the example on the right. Uh, so, in this example, uh, assume that these vertices on the left are high degree vertices. Okay, they are in H, and uh, these vertices on the right have degree less than delta over 2. Now, in the second step, each vertex in H marks one of its incident edges. So, for instance, uh, we get that this vertex uh, marks this edge, uh, this vertex marks this edge, and this bottom left vertex uh, marks uh, this edge here. Okay, good. This is step two. Now, as a, uh, as a third step, uh, we add to the matching marked edges, but only those that are disjoint uh, with the other marked with the other marked edges. So in this in this specific example, we will add to the matching only this edge here, only this edge. E okay, good. And uh, so this is part of the matching. Nothing happens with these ones. And then as a fourth step, we remove all match vertices, which will include this one, which is not in H, and will include this one. But we also remove all non match vertices, which are in H, which will include these two vertices as well. Okay, so we do this. And now uh, the remaining graph looks like uh, this one on the right. And then we repeat this process on the remaining graph. Uh, one can show that this process gives you a constant pattern approximation of maximum matchings or maximum matching at and it requires only log delta many steps. Okay, uh, good. And uh, this this algorithm actually uh, or some or, or a variant of this algorithm was designed in the 80s in the context of PRAM, but later it was um, not exactly this, but uh, several different variants were used in, in different results uh, and in, uh, even for dynamic algorithms, for MPC algorithms. Uh, so this, uh, if there is something to uh, take from this talk, then this is really uh, this algorithm because of its generality and uh, really used uh, over the years uh, for many results, right? And again, very simple algorithm uh, and robust to, and robust to uh, changes in the, in the setting of parameters. So, this is the peeling approach. Now, uh, <clears throat> we are moving uh, to the first technique, uh, which was uh, introduced by Parnas and Ron in 2007. So, what is the technique? Uh, let ALG be a, a local algorithm. When I say local, I mean uh, a local in terms of distributed uh, computation, where uh, every two uh, incident uh, vertices uh, can exchange message uh, in one round of computation, arbitrary size message in one round of computation. So let ALG be one such local algorithm that runs in R rounds. Okay, good. And the idea is now that we can simulate this algorithm with delta to the R many uh, LCA probes. And why is that the case? Well, in every round of uh, in every round of local uh, algorithm, uh, 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 only two adjacent vertices exchange message. So it means that the state of this vertex V, let's say whether it's meshed or not, depends 
uh, on the vertices uh, on the vertices which are within distance r, right? Not beyond that. Uh, so it means that in order to uh, figure out what is happening with this guy here, with this vertex v, uh, it suffices to uh, look at the neighborhood uh, which is a distance r, and we can collect this entire neighborhood in, in delta to the uh, in delta to the r uh, LCA uh, LCA probes, right? We can collect the entire neighborhood at one place. And then we can simulate, we can simulate algorithm, let's say peeling algorithm uh, for, for, for this guy by having all this information inside. And then as corollary, we are, get, we are getting that the peeling algorithm can be simulate, simulated in LCA with delta to the uh, load delta many probes. Uh, again, delta is maximum degree of our graph, and as we saw on the previous slide, um, uh, the peeling approach requires log delta information, uh, log, log, log delta iterations. Uh, and it's easy to see that uh, that for all the vertices, decision in one uh, in one iteration can be done independently. Okay, good, great. So by using this idea, uh, by using this idea, uh, using this reduction, we get LCA in this, uh, in this uh, uh, probe complexity. Of course, the question is, uh, can we do something better? Uh, and um, there, is a, there is a result from 2019 by Gaffari and Wittow uh, who showed that this type of approach that you just saw uh, can be uh, sparsified. It doesn't need to require the delta to the log delta many probes. You can do it more efficiently. Just would like to mention that the main focus of that paper was to improve uh, LCA and also MPC, design MPC algorithms for MIS, uh, but not for matchings. Um, uh, nevertheless, I will describe the approach in the context of matchings. And also this uh, paper, uh, these ideas that you that you that I will show you, uh, uh, they have some applications on coloring and also uh, set, set, set cover. Uh, by using some different approaches, there's some different algorithms and peeling, uh, one can also get uh, more efficient LCAs. Uh, great. So let us see how this one works. Just on the previous slide, we said that um, if we have uh, if we have an algorithm, local algorithm that uh, requires some rounds of computation, we can simulate this local algorithm by uh, by um, uh, collecting uh, the entire graph. Which is in this in this ball round V, and we can simulate the state of the algorithm for this vertex V. But the question is, do we really need to look at every single edge in every single vertex within this radius R? Right. So if you think of this, uh, if you think of this uh, blue area as the volume uh, of computation that you have to perform, or a volume of uh, LCA probes that you have to perform to learn state for V. Well, the question is, is it maybe something uh, like this that you need to collect in some parts, maybe more information, but then some other parts, uh, then some other parts get very sparse, like this, or uh, there are significant chunks of, uh, of, of uh, content, uh, content of the graph, uh, which you don't need to inspect at all. And... Um, Actually, the, the this paper, uh, the file and uh they uh, they show that yes, uh, this is indeed possible uh, for for matchings as well, but not even only for matchings uh, for for uh, MIS, uh, they they are getting actually significant improvement. Uh, so, uh, as a reminder, partner strong reduction, uh, just we saw on the last slide, gave you uh, gave us delta to the log delta uh, many LCA probes. Uh, to uh, to approximate maximum matchings, but the approach that uh, the Fari, um, the Fari and Uito design, uh, they give you uh, in the context of matchings, they give you delta to the log log delta many probes. Uh, what we will see now in the following couple of slides is how the main idea to get delta uh, to the root uh, log delta many probes. Uh, the, the underlying, the, 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 the basic, more important, the most important underlying idea behind both complexity is, is very similar, which I'm going to describe, but it takes uh, more effort to go from square root log delta to log log delta, which again, 
we will not see in this talk. So let us now briefly see how to get uh, this query complexity. Uh, the idea again uh, in the file in Uito is also to simulate uh, this peeling approach. Okay, uh, this is the same algorithm that we saw just a couple of slides ago. Imagine now that uh, instead of running this approach for log delta man iterations, we run this approach for square root log delta man iterations. Right? Uh, we just we, we, we just stop. We, we, just, we just cut at this point. Good. So, what is now that we can deduce about uh, this modified approach? Well, the first one is that vertices in H, right, uh, during, the, uh, during all these iterations, that have degree between delta divided by 2 to the uh, roots log delta and delta. Uh, previously, uh, their degrees uh, at the very last iterations uh, were even constant, right? Uh, 1, 2, or maybe 0. But this time, uh, we have uh, this uh, much larger lower bound. Now, uh, here is an idea. Uh, it seems that if you don't care to execute all iterations, that these vertices that we care about are sufficiently dense they have still a pretty large degree. Why not just sparsifying the entire graph, sparsifying by this factor, right, inversely proportional to this, and these high degree vertices will still uh, have uh, at least a few incident edges, and maybe, maybe in this graph, in this sparsified graph, we still can find large enough matching uh, large enough matching uh, for vertices uh, that have uh, a degree at least delta divided by two to the uh, root log delta. Right. So this is uh, this is the idea, and um, uh, what they uh, what they actually show uh, is that uh, this idea indeed you can make this idea work, uh, which is again precisely of sparsifying the entire graph uh, at this rate. And working with graph that has now much smaller uh, maximum degree, maximum degree the new graph right after sparsifying with this at this rate would become two to the root log delta. Right before we had delta, but now uh, maximum degree will become this much. Okay, so this is very nice because remember uh, our LC complexity does depend on maximum degree. And moreover, because we now care about executing uh, a, a root of log delta many iterations, it means that by using uh, after specification, if we use partners wrong reduction direct on this sparsified graph, we get that um, um, we get that uh, prop complexity is this much, which is exactly delta. And all of a sudden now we got from. Uh, we, we got from uh, complexity for, for uh, from probe complexity being delta to the uh, log delta from that much to only delta, which is fantastic improvement, right? Uh, the thing is now that if you think in terms of uh, all the iterations that you have in the peeling approach, uh, this uh, modification allows you to handle only a small fraction a small fraction uh, of these steps and it might be the fact that um, sorry the small fraction of these iterations and it might be the case that um, most of the matching mass is in the remaining iterations right so you need to handle these iterations as well uh, but now that's uh, that's simple right uh, in the sense that it's simple um, First, you would simulate uh, all these guys. It would require you uh, all these iterations. By doing proper specification, it would require uh, delta probes. And now uh, you will move uh, to these uh, remaining guys, right? You, you, you will remove to the next chunk of square, of, uh, square root uh, log delta iterations. And you will, you will repeat this square root uh, log delta many times. And now if you look at the total complexity after doing this uh, um, reduced specification, 
you compute uh, for one for, for one chunk of uh, square root log delta iteration, then you specify again even more aggressively for the next chunk and so on. Now, if you look at the total complexity for this, it is only delta to the square root log delta. And uh, uh, this is again significant uh, save uh, compared to uh, simulating uh, peeling approach uh, directly in LCA without this specification. And just to mention again, uh, um, there are ways to get uh, the other show how the other show how to get uh, even faster than this to get delta to the log of delta uh, complexity for uh, for uh, constructing approximate maximum matrix. We are now moving to the third technique that we call early stopping. Starting point on this approach is fractional peeling algorithm. Uh, this version of peeling algorithm. First constructs fractional matching, and then it rounds its fractional to an integral one. Um, let us now go step by step over this fractional peeling. So these two lines don't exist in the uh, version of peeling that we saw before. Um, fractional peeling maintains an edge weights uh, for each edge, which corresponds to fractional matching of edges. And initially, all edge weights are equal are set to zero. Also. Each edge can be active or inactive uh, in this algorithm. And initially, uh, all edges are said to be uh, active. Now, <clears throat> the algorithm proceeds in log delta iterations, uh, just as before. And in, uh, in each iteration, there are two steps. In the first step, uh, the algorithm uh, increases edge weight by 2 to the i divided by delta of each active edge. Inactive edges don't, uh, don't change their weights. Uh, then in the second step, um, the algorithm now look at every vertex independently and for each and, and for a given vertex, uh, the algorithm uh, sums uh, the, the set of edge weights incident to this vertex and if the, uh, if the uh, sum of edge weights is at least one, then this vertex becomes inactive. And more importantly, all edges incident to this vertex become inactive and remain inactive throughout the end of this algorithm. And this step uh, two uh, essentially says that uh, we want to ensure that no vertex has too much matching, uh, too much matching weight incident to it. And again, once we get this fractional matching, we just round this to an integral one. Now, our task here is to learn uh, edge weights uh, that this algorithm will produce. Uh, but uh, given an edge uv, uh, this task of learning edge weight of, of uh, e can be reduced to that of figuring out uh, when a u or v uh, become, uh, become inactive. Uh, because once u or v become inactive, it means that the weight of edge e of edge E is not going to change anymore, right? And uh, so it seems that uh, the, the, our goal now is to figure out uh, when a given vertex, uh, when a given vertex becomes inactive at what iteration a given vertex becomes inactive. And moreover, we would like to do that very efficiently in the context of LCA. So let us see how to do this. Um, I will define something um, which we call um, level uh, J test of V, um, and this test will return active or inactive, and uh, it will be active if and only if V is active after iteration after iteration uh, J, and otherwise it will return inactive. So let us see now how to simulate how to simulate uh, this test, uh, how to simulate, uh, how to execute this test for j is equal to 1, right? Uh, the very first iteration. Uh, intuitively, uh, j here corresponds to uh, iteration, uh, iteration j of the peeling approach. So uh, here is level 1 test. It's very simple. We look at the degree of v. If the degree of v is at least delta over 2, then we should say that this guy is inactive because uh, it would uh, it will gather enough 
uh, it will gather enough weight already in this first iteration. But if the degree of E is less than delta over 2, we know that vertex V will be active in the next iteration as well. Okay, so very simple. Now, I will just slightly modify uh, this test. Uh, so that it's easier to use this uh, for j is greater than 1. And here is something that an expectation has uh, the same behavior as this test above, but now instead of looking at the degree, uh, you, sample, you sample neighbors of v at rate 2 over delta. Okay, at this rate you sample neighbors, neighbors of, of v, each edge incident to v is sampled independently uh, with this probability. And now, if it happens that uh, at least one edge is sampled, then we will think that V has a high enough degree, namely at least delta over 2, and we will say, okay, this vertex uh, will become inactive now in this iteration 1, but if no edge is sampled in this process, no edge incidence to V is sampled in this process, we will just say, okay, active V will be active in the next iteration. So, that's it. This is level 1. Very simple approach. Let's see how to get level 2 now. Okay, so <clears throat> here is level 2. First of all, S corresponds uh, to the sum of weights uh, incident to vertex V. Incident to vertex V. So this is, uh, uh, th this is the sum of weights uh, that we talked about in this step 2. This is what S is for. Now, as before for level 1 test, uh, we, uh, we could, for level 2 test, also look at every, uh, at every vertex, W1, W2, W3, incident to V, and then ask for W1, whether W1 uh, is, uh, is still active, is still active uh, in, the, in the second iteration or not. We can do the same for W2, the same for W3, but the point is that looking at every single neighbor of V uh, would be too expensive. So what we do instead, uh, we, we uh, sample the neighborhood of V um, uh, with, uh, at this rate, uh, at, at rate 4 over delta, uh, and then only for the edges uh, that we see, we will perform this type of task, where, we will, where, uh, where we, uh, we will ask whether the neighbor W uh, is still active in the second, is still active in the second, um, uh, in the second iteration or not, right? And this is precisely what this part of the algorithm does. So, this part that says S is equal to uh, S plus one half, well, this accounts for the fact that every uh, incident edge to V uh, was active in the first iteration. In the first iteration, it would uh, get weight uh, 2 uh, over delta, but because we sampled uh, with, with rate 4 over delta, uh, it means when we appropriate the scale, uh, we should account this by adding, uh, by adding weight 1 half, right? As opposed to 2 over delta. And now uh, this, uh, this test uh, asks whether, uh, whether a given edge uh, will still be active uh, in iteration 2. If it's active in the iteration 2, then we are adding uh, essentially 4 over delta, but again, appropriately scaled uh, with this sampling rate. And that's it. Uh, and uh, if at any point uh, the sum of weights around V becomes uh, at least 1, which is the same as in step 2, we just say, okay, this vertex now becomes inactive, otherwise we are saying, okay, uh, even at the end of iteration, uh, iteration 2, uh, vertex V is active, and, and that's it. And now we can extrapolate. It's actually uh, very direct to extrapolate this uh, level, J, uh, level 2 test to level J test. And here is just side by side uh, how we do that. Um, we still have uh, this summation is equal to 0. Um, this is just our uh, default summation. Now, um, we have that um, here, um, n of, uh, here n of v um, is, is sampled uh, at rate 4 over delta, uh, but in j test we will sample uh, uh, at rate 2 to j over delta, and then we perform the same. Uh, so here is just, uh, uh, again, um, kind of sparsified emulation of this fractional 
peeling, uh, which is then for, uh, for, for test J, it is very similar uh, as we had for level J, it is very similar to what we had for level two. Uh, the, uh, the main difference now is that uh, we, don't, uh, we don't look only at whether, uh, whether uh, edge uh, VW um, uh, is active in the is, is active uh, after the first iteration. We have to see whether it's active after the first iteration, second iteration, and so on, up to iteration uh, J, uh, up to iteration J, and uh, and then we uh, increment some and and we scale appropriately, and and that's it. And this is our simulation of fractional peeling. Now, a uh, nice feature, very really nice feature of this simulation, uh, is that. The, the way uh, these weights are set and the way, uh, let me just go back, and the way how we terminate if the weight becomes uh, large, if the weight becomes large enough, is set in such a way that deterministically uh, one can show by induction uh, that uh, the number of probes needed for test, uh, for level J test is uh, 2 to the J. Because J is at most low delta, it means that for a level, a level J test for any J is O delta. Uh, and again, uh, one, uh, one get this deterministically, uh, even though the process itself is, is randomized. Uh, and uh, relatively simple uh, induction shows this. But the main, the main technical part, the main technical complexity of the full approach goes into showing that this indeed, uh, this indeed gives you uh, the right approximation guarantee. I will not go into details. Uh, I will just mention that uh, one of the differences, uh, if you compare um, the oral approach uh, of, this, um, of this result compared to uh, some other, uh, uh, some other um, algorithms is that um, here we really have budget, uh, we, we really uh, decide on the budget if you want to give to the algorithm, budget of how many, uh, uh, how many probes it can make, and uh, how large uh, uh, graph it can, uh, uh, how, how big subgraph it, uh, it can look at. And then uh, once it exceeds this budget, we just stop the algorithm. So the algorithm itself um, and the query complexity becomes uh, very simple. But in some other approaches that we saw, uh, the main um, effort was put into uh, uh, into molding the algorithm uh, so that you get approaches which are more and more efficient. Uh, but here is the other way around. And while then, on the other hand, while in some other cases you get approximation guarantee uh, almost for free, uh, here one has to work uh, hard to get to show that the approximation uh, is actually good. And by this, I would conclude um, discussion uh, about this technique as well. And let me conclude um, the full presentation by a couple of open questions. Uh, one of the perhaps um, most interesting uh, questions uh, when it comes to uh, known uh, explore problem, uh, graph problems in the context of LCA is whether we can get maximum dependent set um, query access of maximum dependent set in poly delta uh, log n uh, times uh, log n uh, probes. Uh, the best known so far is uh, by uh, Gafari and Uito, uh, the result that we mentioned as a second technique, uh, as a second paper uh, that achieves uh, delta to the log log uh, delta uh, probe complexity. So it was also nice showing that uh, maybe poly delta is not actually possible. Uh, another problems uh, which are uh, natural follow-ups, another question which are natural follow-ups of uh, these algorithms that we saw, uh, and in particular uh, the, the last result is uh, whether we can get maximal matching uh, at the same uh, query complexity, that maybe perhaps some shattering techniques uh, could be used here to show that one can get uh, uh, this uh, complexity. And um, so uh, we talked, uh, um, most of these results that we, that we or actually all results that we talked about, uh, except one of the references, uh, they're expressed in, in uh, maximum degree delta. 
Right, but one can hope that uh, this delta bar is average degree of a graph. One can hope that uh, the right dependence is maybe average degree, and it would be nice to uh, kind of uh, get these results that we saw, uh, which are in terms of uh, which are uh, which are in terms of average degree as opposed to maximum degree. Uh, and it would be nice, uh, as we saw by the, uh, as we saw by uh, even uh, motivating scenarios, to come up with other problems where, can I, where we can apply this technique. So maybe uh, you start from similar techniques and then uh, play with them, uh, uh, tune them, and get uh, and get improved results. And uh, maybe as the last question, um, um, which uh, I believe is also very interesting. Um, one of the main motivations for LCA is, uh, uh, is, is very with large graphs, right? We work with large objects in general. Uh, and many of these objects uh, do change over the time. And like the question is, uh, can we accommodate uh, these changes? Uh, can, we, can we design interesting algorithms that accommodate uh, these changes very efficiently? Uh, Thank you. By this, I will conclude. Uh, thank you.